Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're now ready to start, and I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Stavros Paspalas, the director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, and I very warmly welcome you to this evening's um, function. I shall deliver the director's report, not just for one year, but for 2019, 20, and 21. As you are aware, we all had to change our plans owing to the pandemic, and a good number had to be altered radically. My own presence in Greece was impacted, and I could only return recently, and needless to say, I am very pleased to be back. At this stage, I should, um, not just should, but I want to um, thank my colleagues, uh, Dr. Lita Tortopoulou Gregory and Panayota Korogli, um, for keeping the Athens end of our operations um, so effectively and efficiently working um, during the past difficult years. I shall begin with by outlining various activities undertaken by the Institute, and then I shall report on the archaeological fieldwork conducted on Kithera, at Zagora on Andros, in Athens, and at Perahora, as well as on continuing research at Neopapos on Cyprus. Thereafter, I shall call upon our guest, Dr. Kristen Mann, to deliver this year's annual lecture. I shall like to begin with an expression of thanks to the Ministry of Culture and Sport particularly to the Directorate of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities and that of the Directorate of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Antiquities. The Ephoreas for the Antiquities of the Piraeus and the Islands, of the Cyclades, of Athens, and of the Corinthia, as well as to the Foreign Schools Department. Without the support of their staff members, our Institute's fieldwork and the numerous research programs of Australian academics and students in Greece simply would not be possible. Of course, Australians benefited from the good offices of many of the ministry's other departments and museums, the staff of which aided them in their research endeavours. We are truly grateful to the ministry for all this help. We are equally grateful to the foreign schools which have facilitated the research of visiting Australian scholars and students and the support we have received from the Archaeological Society of Athens. In this spirit, I would like to extend our Institute's appreciation to Professor Manuele Papi, Director of the Italian School, for making these premises available to us this evening, and to the staff of the Institute for accommodating our needs. And similarly, to Dr. Jenny Wallenstein, Director of the Swedish Institute, for graciously making her Institute's building available for the reception that will follow these more formal proceedings. I would also like to express a warm thank you in advance to our Athens Friends organization for supporting the reception, as well as to His Excellency the Australian Ambassador to Greece, Mr. Arthur Spiru, for supplying the fine Australian wine, which we shall have the opportunity to enjoy in a short while. On a sadder note, I cannot but begin the report by acknowledging the death of the founder of the Institute, the late Professor Alexander Kambitoglou in November 2019. After numerous attempts to hold a fitting memorial which had to be deferred owing to COVID-19, we were able to do so this past March at the University of Sydney. I am pleased to say that this well-attended event was live-streamed and I know that a good number of friends, colleagues and supporters of Alexander here in Greece participated in this event, albeit ex apostasios. Alexander Kambitoglou arrived in Sydney in 1960 after studying in Greece and England and teaching in the US. He was a visionary who also had the gift of inspiring others and of harnessing their energies in order to see grand designs come to fruition. He taught generations of university students and reorganised Australia's premier collection of antiquities, the Nicholson Museum, so that it served both as a teaching facility and as a venue that drew the general public. Kambitoglou led the first Australian fieldwork under the auspices of the Archaeologia to Greece, specifically to the early Iron Age settlement of Zagora, and after Zagora, Toroni in the Chalkidiki followed. All the while, he continued his studies of the Greek red figure pottery of southern Italy, particularly Apulian. In 1980, he established the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens and worked tirelessly thereafter to ensure its success. His vision saw his two homelands, Greece and Australia, intimately bound, allowing Australians to
to conduct research in Greece and aiding them to disseminate their results of their endeavors internationally, as well as promoting Greek studies in Australia. He radically altered for the better the academic and more general landscape of Greek studies in his adopted country, and a large number of people have been beneficiaries of his vision. His contribution was recognized by Australia by the award of many honors, foremost being his Order of Australia, while his contribution to Greece was recognized here by the award of the Order of the Phoenix in 1998. Indeed, as many of you know, he remained committed to Greece, and when he was honored by becoming a member of the Academy of Athens, he took the attendant duties very seriously. Those of us who knew him well could only admire his reserves of energy and determination. Alexander Kometoglou is missed, but his legacy is profound and it continues strongly. Of course, we were not able to hold our usual program of lectures as planned in Australia or Greece over the past few years, though the Institute was active with a full program of events, mostly held over Zoom which allowed audiences both in Australia and, inter and internationally to participate. And it's gratifying to note that the numbers were consistently um, very impressive. Though to remain in Australia for a moment, in 2019, Dr. Kristen Mann, of whom we shall hear more in a moment, though on a different topic, established the Institute's Digital Horizons Project, which she, until recently, directed with Thomas Romanus, who continues as its director. This project trains student volunteers, over a hundred today, from six Australian universities in areas such as archaeological data interpretation, database management, digitization, and digital media auditing, artifact processing, and the use of geographic mapping software. And that's just to name a few areas. Importantly, at the same time as the students gain new skills, our institute's archival records are digitized so advancing our research and publication program. Much of the Digital Horizons project was achievable remotely, so allowing Australian students to engage with Greek archaeology, albeit at a distance, during a period in which travel to Greece itself was simply not possible. For the same reason, unfortunately, we were not able to offer scholarships to students to undertake research trips over the last few years. However, the 2019-2020 Institute Fellow, Dr. Emden Dodd, was able to undertake part of his research into the material remains relating to Hellenistic, Roman, and late antique wine and olive oil production in the Cyclades before restrictions were imposed. It is pleasing to note that the work he undertook during his time in Greece has led to new research avenues. It is also encouraging to note that student groups from Australia will return for in-situ education courses in 2023. The last that could be offered were in 2019, and we're particularly pleased that these uh, programs uh, are starting once more. At this point, I should also mention that throughout the COVID years, the Institute issued three bulletins, as well as its more regular newsletters, and under the supervision of Professor Jean-Paul de Coe, three volumes of our research journal, Mediterranean Archaeology, were published. It is also gratifying that I can report that the Artists in Residence program, initiated in 2014, continued throughout 2019, 20, and 21, as we were able to offer the award to Australian artists resident in the UK or continental Europe. This residency program is open both to visual and to literary artists, and it, has, and it has, to date, been awarded to practitioners in both fields. In 2019, it was awarded to Dr. Sari Zalaniri, an artist and cultural historian with varied research and creative interests, one of which focuses on Palestinian Orthodox religious networks and artifacts, and their secularization in the late Ottoman and British Mandate periods. While in Athens, Dr. Zalaniri concentrated on the production of 20th century Orthodox Palestinian religious iconography and devotional goods, and the increasing secularization of much of the work of Palestinian icon painters, a phenomenon which also has good parallels. The 2020 award was made to Scott Miles, a London-based Australian artist who principally works as a painter, concerned with communicative, particularly written systems and their modes and limits of presentation. 
During his time in Athens, Scott Miles benefited from his examination, particularly in the Epigraphic Museum, of the various means used through time to record speech and text, given his interests in how abstract systems are used to convey subject matter. Demonstrating our commitment to cultural exchange between the contemporary Greek artistic community and its Australian counterpart, the Institute was fortunate to publish in our bulletin in 2020 a critical review written by our creative research fellow, Dr. A. Lou Hayeswinkel, on the important exhibition, Theorimata II, on history, presented at the National Museum of Contemporary Art here in Athens. The exhibition included the works of 56 contemporary Greek artists, one of which is illustrated here, selected by 25 curators in response to the project's overarching curatorial prompt on history offered by Bia Papadopoulou, art historian, curator, and the then General Secretary of Aika Halas. The successful applicant for the 2021 Creative Contemporary Residency was Anna Higgins, whose principal field is also painting, with a particular interest in celestial observation and the study of atmospheric weather. Her work in Athens benefited from her consultations with Dr. Fiori Anastasia Metalinou of the National Observatory in Athens, and with the collector of rare books, Dimitrios Varounis, regarding, particularly regarding the map of the moon, the most complete at the time, prepared in 1878 by Julius Schmidt, the director of the Athens Observatory. Parallel to the Institute's contemporary creative residency, the University of Wollongong also offers its own program under our Institute's aegis. In 2019, the Wollongong residency was awarded to Bonnie Cairncross, whose particular artistic practice revolves primarily around hand stitching. While in Athens, she was able to engage with a wide range of material and various media which enriched her creative practice. The Institute is pleased that it retains contact with its past contemporary creative residents, and in this vein, we were very happy to welcome back the 2015 awardee, award-winning Brisbane-based poet Jenna Woodhouse, who presented an evening of poetry in 2019. Now I turn to the Institute's fieldwork. In 2019, the Australian Kaido Kithera Archaeological Survey, in short known as APCAS, directed by Professor Timothy Gregory, Dr. Lita Jotopoulou Gregory and myself, which investigates the northern part of the island, undertook a four-week study season, which included a one-week agricultural terraces sampling study designed to determine the chronology of these intricate and highly sophisticated human-constructed landforms so characteristic of Kithera. The main objective of the geoarchaeological study was to document the various construction techniques and to determine the chronology of the field terraces in selected areas of the island and to test a new methodology for the study of terraces that may be applicable to similar landscape formations in the broader eastern Mediterranean. Fieldwork involved the collection of soil samples for micromorphological analyses, as well as for optical stimulated luminescence or cell dating. The micromorphological samples were collected from three different locations in and near Caravas, two from Kambi Keram, Keramari, and one from the Bronze Age site of Theodorakia. Both these areas were investigated from 2016 through to 18, and noted significant considerations of Middle and Late Bronze Age ceramics and lithics. And here I show a view of Kambi Keramari and the results of the uh, survey and of Theodorakia. The terraces selected for the 2019 study were identified on the basis of their collapsed retaining walls in an effort to minimize any disturbance to the landscape and the existing wall construction. The results of the OSL examinations have established that the terraces sampled at Theodorakia date at least back to the 13th, if not the 11th century AD, while a sample from Kambi dates to the this construction of a terrace there to between the 15th and 11th centuries BC. Clearly, these are areas for further focused study. In 2020 and 21, APCAS conducted brief study seasons on the material collected in the earlier years, focusing primarily on the examination of the Bronze Age ceramics. Allied to APCAS, the Institute, here led by Dr. Vita Totopoulou Gregory, is also party to the multi year. Erasmus Plus funded project, Find Stories, addressing mobility through object and people biographies. 
and is partnered in this project with the University of Bristol, Cardiff Metropolitan University, the Archaeological Museum in Zagreb, the YMCA Basketball Museum in Thessaloniki, and the International School in Belgrade. This project examines human mobility diachronically in southeastern Europe through archaeological and anthropological investigations. Oops, sorry, I missed the slide. The first physical meeting of the participating members took place at the Institute in August 21 and featured a series of papers addressing different aspects of the project, including fieldwork, research design, and implementation. July 2019 saw the Zagora Archaeological Project, coordinated by Professor Margaret Miller, Dr. Leslie Beaumont, Dr. Paul Donnelly, and myself, return to the field. The team undertook excavation, archaeological surface survey, and infrared remote sensing to explore targeted areas both inside the settlement and in the hinterland. Three excavation trenches were opened in the northeast part of the settlement, where the 2014 fieldwork had identified features not hitherto known of the site. Excavation in Trench 11 continued work begun in 2014 in room E4, uh, indicated as Area 3 on the current slide. Uh, the excavations then had reached the lower roof collapse, um, and part, uh, which also included displaced clay lining fragments, and partially exposed the disturbed a disturbed schist installation in the northwest corner of the room. In 2019, the full ground plan of E4 was revealed, and the adjacent unroofed area, F4, to the south and east, were further investigated to reveal an additional section of the wide road-like surface and the stone channel that cuts through it. And here we see these features in plan. Soil chemistry, phytolith and soil micromorphology samples were obtained for the three impact surfaces and two packing fills excavated in F4, while the stratigraphy suggests that the drain and spaces F7 and F8 to the southeast at the bottom right of the plan were notably later than the original E4 and likely contemporary with it, its renovation. It was determined that the final period of use of E4 was late geometric too, towards the very end of the 8th century BC, though some residual earlier middle geometric material was also identified. Excavation of the room revealed that the disturbed feature in the northwest corner had collapsed onto a significant layer of ash. Collapsed schist slabs interspersed with fragmentary clay lining by the northeast wall may indicate the presence of a second clay lined installation. The northeast corner also revealed what might be the modified remains of an earlier wall. The occurrence of at least one and possibly two collapsed schist features combined with extensive finds of clay lining fragments may suggest the presence of a processing or manufacturing facility within E4. It is expected that samples collected for residue, phytolith, and soil, say, chemi soil chemistry analyses will reveal details as to the activities conducted in this anomalous to date room, as well as well the study of material collected via flotation and soil micromorphology. The second trench excavated in 2019, Trench 12, was opened approximately 14 meters southwest of E4 and was opened with the aim of ground truthing a subsurface thermal anomaly shaped like a figure eight that had been recorded by the Zagora Infrared Photogrammetry Project in 2017. Directly below the plow soil was found a fill densely packed with stone rubble, pottery, and above all, animal bone. The ceramic evidence indicated that this fill had been deposited uh, towards the end of the 8th century BC. It contained this impressive courseware incised stand and fragments of an incised plate, along with a lot of other ceramic material, of course. Below these late 8th century finds were found earlier ceramics, middle geometric and sub-geometric in style, and I only show two examples here. The rock crystal fragment, a category of artifact known best from contemporary sanctuary and funerary deposits elsewhere in the Greek world, was an unexpected find. Trench 13 to the north of Trench 12 
was opened in order to investigate a large subsurface anomaly identified by the magnetometry survey conducted in 2012 by a team led by Dr. Apostolos Salis. Excavation revealed a layer of water laps extending across the whole trench, removal of which exposed remains of a small section of schist-built wall which incorporated a threshold block and a door jam, which you can see in the slide. The pottery found beneath the wall and the roof collapse was late geometric in date, so late in the 8th century. The occupation and abandonment deposit of the interior of the room also produced a bronze pin, bone, shell, pumice, a stone pounder, obsidian, and significant amounts of slag. The sieved soil was tested with, for, with a magnet for hammer scale, that is, iron oxide waste produced during the smithing process, and again, significant amounts were recorded. Samples for soil chemistry analysis were collected, though the finds of slag and hammer scale indicate that smithing was undertaken within the exposed room. In parallel to the excavation within the ancient settlement, an archaeological surface survey was conducted in Sintaland to its northeast and east, which complemented the extramural survey undertaken in 2012. In this, in this slide, the red 2019 units are color-coded to show the density of finds, with the darker shade representing greater numbers. The units examined in 2012 are shaded yellow. The most notable outcome of the survey was the absence of Iron Age ceramic finds, or evidence of manipulation of the landscape. So uh, the absence of finds which can be, uh, which date to the same period as the settlement of Sarwara. By contrast, the concentration of um, late Roman pottery on the hill, particularly on the hill slopes east of the settlement, suggests the existence of a farm or other habitation in this location of this much later period. Finally, a program of thermographic sensing was undertaken in 2019 by Dr. Hugh Thomas. Thermography utilizes infrared cameras to detect subtle changes in ground temperature caused by subsurface archaeological remains. Over the course of the diurnal cycle, buried remains heat or cool at different rates to that of the surrounding ground. These heat disparities can be detected by infrared cameras. Thermographic sensing was conducted in the area of trench 11 and 12, as we saw a moment ago, with the aim of clarifying some anomalies picked up in earlier remote and geophysical surveys. Thermographical investigations were also undertaken in Zagoras's hinterland, where a number of anomalies were recorded. The nature is still under consideration. I now move to Athens. In October 2019, Dr. Matthias Delbo from the University of Western Australia, in collaboration with Professor Gerhard Zimmer of the Katholische Universität Eichstätt, undertook a geographical prospection of an ancient bronze foundry in an area just south of the Temple of Olympian Zeus in central Athens, the casting pit of which was first noted by John Travlos in 1971. And you can just make out one of the columns of the temple behind the monumental uh, terrace wall. An area of approximately 60 square meters was investigated using ground penetrating radar and multi-electrode resistivity tomography with the aim of verifying the existence and exact location of the ancient casting pit, as well as to look for other pits, ditches, or foundations typical of Greek foundries of the 5th century BC. The results from the multiple parallel survey lines used using both methods were combined to generate models of the subsurface the main target of the survey was the casting pit of the 5th century found foundry, which was clearly located. Further analyses of the preliminary results are underway in order to better understand the other features which were revealed during the survey. We now, though, have a far better understanding of this casting pit, which can be considered alongside that investigated on the Athenian Acropolis's south slope. Just before the coronavirus impacted on the world, a new multi-year Greek-Australian project was initiated under the aegis of our institute by Dr. Susan Lupak of Macquarie University, Sydney, in collaboration with the director of the effort of antiquities of uh, Corinthia, Panayota Kasimi, entitled the Perakora Peninsula Archaeological Project. 
The mandated area which the project covers is just under 30 um, square kilometers and is outlined in the purple <coughs> map. Of course, the sanctuary of Hira, which is located within the red rectangle, the sanctuary of um, Hira Akrea and its immediate environs of Perahora in the easternmost regions of the Gulf of Corinth have long been investigated and excavated, foremost by teams led by Humphrey Payne and Tom Dunbabin of the BSA in the 1930s and more recently by Richard Tomlinson. The current project's aim is to achieve a better diachronic understanding of the wider region. More particularly, firstly, to map and document the remains of habitation, cultic, funerary and waterworks structures which were discovered in the past but have not been recorded to current standards. Secondly, to survey intensively the regions surrounding known sites in order to discover their full chronological parameters and the extent of their boundaries during different time periods. And thirdly, to investigate areas of the peninsula that have not yet been explored in order to acquire a fuller understanding of the region's diachronic settlement patterns. As a first step, the project initially examined the area known as the Upper Plain, which had been described by Payne as a substantial town, but by Tomlinson as a scatter of houses. The team verified and documented the legacy data provided by a plan prepared by Tomlinson and conducted an intensive surface survey across the plain. Nearly all the previously recorded structures were revealed, measured, drawn and photographed, while the coordinates were recorded. Indeed, a number of structures that had not been documented in the past were also documented. A full third of the structures recorded were not attested in the legacy data. Furthermore, a significant amount of time was dedicated to the cleaning of the substantial building known as A1 in order to ready it for photogrammetry. The fountain house was also cleared for the same purpose, and you can see a before and after um, view here. The surface survey was conducted concurrent concurrently and its results informed the project's legacy data verification efforts as field workers reported potential structures which were subsequently investigated by the legacy data team. The teams walked approximately 17 hectares, an area which stretched from the modern boundary of the sanctuary site to the western shore of Lake Ruyakmeni. A total of 22,817 artifacts were counted, including a couple of clusters of miniature virtues, 6th and 5th century BC in date, which may indicate the location of open-air shrines. Artifacts, mainly ceramics and architectural materials, though some lithics as well, within these collected assemblages date from the early Bronze Age through to the early modern era. But archaic, classic and Hellenistic artifacts dominate. While such finds were most abundant closer to the sanctuary and the tip of the peninsula, they did occur throughout the study area. Prehistoric material was rare. The most securely dated were found, uh, most securely dated prehistoric material was found um, from the, and collected from the eroded banks of the Lake Huyakmeni. Roman and medieval finds were most abundant um, in the upper plain. 2019 was the first of a planned multi-season project on the Perahora Peninsula. Unfortunately, the advent of COVID-19 meant that the team's initial program had to change and field work be suspended, but it is expected that it will resume in 2023. Beyond Greece, our institute also supports the Pathos Theatre Archaeological Project on Cyprus, a project which is based at the University of Sydney and directed by Dr. Craig Barker. This project has examined the Hellenistic and Roman theatre and its environs at Paphos since 1995. In 2019, the main areas of investigation were the area of the major paved Roman Decumanus Road of the 2nd century AD to the south of the site, that's at the bottom right, a medieval structure located at the top of the theatre's seating of Fabrica Hill, and the bedrock cut foundations of the rear of the Roman period stage building. The excavations of a major thoroughfare have been, partly, have been particularly important. At more than eight and a half meters width and with a significant drainage system and clear evidence that the street was colonnaded with granite columns imported from the Troad in Asia Minor, the team is confident in its interpretation that this road was a Decumanus Maximus 
the main east-west artery of the Roman period city. It connected the Agora with the northeastern city gate, which gave access, of course, to the road that led to Balepachos and Aphrodite's renowned sanctuary. And it intersected with the north-south running colonnade of Cardo Maximus, probably just to the west of the theatre. The largest trench of the season was located over the surface of the Decumanus, south of the Nymphaeum building, just to the southeast of the theatre. It revealed a layer of tumbled rocks and architectural fragments. Further investigations determined the dimensions of the insular block, the city block, and confirmed the existence of a secondary road to the south of the Decumanus. Two trenches above the theatre's seating were opened to further investigate a well-constructed medieval building which was first identified in 2012. Initial analysis of ceramics from the area suggested that the building was in use between the 13th and 17th centuries AD with a high concentration of 15th century ceramics. The 13th century levels seem to contain a significant number of sugar molds. Faunal remains are suggestive of elite dining, including bird bones, fish, and even turtle, as well as young goat and sheep. The tentative hypothesis is that the building, when first constructed in the 13th century, acted as a defensive keep and storage center for goods being traded through Patras' harbor. Its occupants had strong links to nearby sugar production, to the nearby sugar production facility. The building's peak activity falls within the Venetian period during the 15th century AD. There is no evidence of industry within the building at this time. Rather, the fine wares located there are suggestive of a wealthy habitation, as of course were other remains of the zoological remains. Finally, a trench was opened along the southern end of the bedrock, which had been cut for the Antonine period stage building. The team's investigations indicate that there was a considerable medieval industrial activity in this area directly over the cuttings of the bedrock for the Roman stage building's foundations. And here you see a, a, a reconstruction of what uh, the uh, Roman period um, theatre may have looked like. And here ends this evening's report. It is now my pleasure to introduce our, the main speaker of the evening, Dr. Kristen Mann. Dr. Mann is an accomplished archaeologist as a researcher, educator, and excavator. She earned her degrees at the University of Sydney, where she distinguished herself, winning a number of awards, including the University Medal. She has worked in positions of responsibility on field projects in Greece, including at Zakhara, Azor Gas on Crete, and Keros Jasof Naxos, she's clearly in demand, and in Jordan and in Australia. Kristen has taught at the University of Sydney for the Department of Archaeology and the Department of Classics and Ancient History, as well as, on repeated occasions, as a guest lecturer on the University of Cambridge and the Cyprus Institute's Cycladic Field School. And the Institute has been very grateful to have her as its postdoctoral researcher, and even more pleased that she has been awarded a Centre for Hellenic Studies Early Career Fellowship from Harvard. Kristen's archaeological interests are wide, but one of her major focuses is settlement life in the past, especially in the Aegean Early Iron Age. Her role on the excavations at Zagora and the study of their results and publication is fundamental. I am certain that her lecture this evening will present this very important site in a new light. So without further, without any further ado, I invite Dr. Mann to deliver her paper, The Material Home in Geometric Greece, a social archaeology of Zagora on Andros. Thank you. Thank you very much, Savros, for that lovely introduction. And 
I really do want to begin with a statement of profound gratitude to Professor Ken Bidiglu and the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens, because without their support, uh, someone from my background in these would not have been able to pursue a career in Greek archaeological research and fieldwork, and I most definitely would not be standing before you today giving this talk, actually, as a researcher. So I am indebted to the Australian Institute and its supporters. But to get to the main event, during the 9th to 7th centuries BC, the Aegean world was changing fast. Its people saw their social fabric and settlement landscape transformed, and they participated in evolving networks and enterprise. And in consequence of growing settlement densities, social codes of interaction and etiquette became more firmly articulated, while the stresses of an expanding world horizon generated a need for new institutions and behavioural frameworks. Such processes saw the genesis of the cultural habitus of the classical world, and the settlement of Zagora and Andros is central to debate as to how these transformations played out. Yet much of our understanding of these dynamics has been drawn from the study of burial contexts, sanctuaries, partial settlement data, epic cycle or ceramics. But the study of settlement evidence and domestic space allows us to explore how people responded to and participated in these changes on a daily basis. While framed as the antecedent for classical Greece, geometric societies and culture were complex, coherent, and very much products of their own time. Sincere apologies, I'm actually not normally such a... Anyway, we got there. <laughs> There's always one. Okay, let's use this instead. All right. Yet querying tangible remains in search of the intangible human values, feelings, and perceptions that they once held can seem impossible. When faced with the enormity of such a task, it's tempting to gloss over the nexus of invested factors and relationships that shape the creation, experience, and perception of built space to fixate on one or two elements only. This certainly makes it easy to paint an impressionist picture of social change that is compelling when considered at a distance. Yet when we look closer at the material remains of houses and reflect on the forces that shape that data, we find the picture hollow, populated by what Ruth Tringham has dubbed the faceless blobs of prehistory. The people and their stories are but ghosts, echoes that we chase by modelling possibilities from the debris that they left behind. And this is the reality of archaeology after all. And the point to be made is not that we cannot or should not attempt to trace the, the intangible from the tangible, but rather that we need to start first with an appreciation of the complex materiality embodied by household remains and engage directly with the circuit of attributes and spatial properties that enable household tasks while simultaneously providing material cues for social behaviour. It's only once we de develop multi-layered material understandings of people and their houses in antiquity that we can begin to tease out elements that plausibly point to larger socio-political inferences. We need to engage with the lived experience of past households. What did daily life and tasks involve? How are these modified by the physical conditions, sensory perception and social engagement that they involved in? Yet our key limitation to prehistoric settlements is that all we have is the material, the physical remains of buildings and the scattered remnants of the belongings that they once held. Yet, as the French poet Bachelard observed, when houses are considered as inhabited space, they become so much more than their material reality. Houses balance pragmatic functionality with the social forces that transform a house into a home. And when trying to understand human society and change via domestic space, to start from the top and pick out elements that seem to fit our interpretive models without first comprehending domestic contexts as lived spaces with functional, practical and social needs, risks placing a weight of meaning on strands of evidence that are ill-suited to bear it. And so today I'm going to be exploring Zagora's materiality, uh, but before we do, I'm going to begin with a brief introduction to the climate context of the site itself, before examining some of the common frameworks through which Zagora is used to explain broader geometric changes and discussing its built space in terms of settlement growth and broader implications. 
And then I'll start to examine some of the evidence for spatial behaviour and material patterns at the site before concluding with some of the discussion about Zagora's abandonment and possible ongoing activity. But to scale right back regarding the broader settlement trends and context of this period, one of the well-attested patterns that has formed so much of our impression of the early Iron Age and the Dark Age of depopulation that was followed by this 8th century renaissance are the data from field surveys. Specifically, you can see here this severe drop-off in the number of sites identified by a surface survey in the early Iron Age. It's a massive gap that was then followed by this exponential dramatic climb up of identified sites through the archaic and geometric periods. However, several scholars have pointed out how subjective these data are and how affected by our methodologies, especially our dependence on surface collection of diagnostic ceramics, which can vary dramatically in reliability and recognisability, both in terms of their diachronical material changes themselves, but also in variable survey methods and also individual skill, le uh, skill levels. So, for instance, I can attest that even experienced field surveyors at Zagara in 2012 struggled to identify pale ceramic sherds in the field. So this is obviously going to be affecting counts and the collection of diagnostic ceramics. Yet, even if we were to take these data at face value as unproblematic, how we choose to interpret the pattern also bears questioning. First and foremost, what we are seeing in these graphs is an increase in the number of sites identified through traditional surface survey. An increase in sites doesn't automatically translate to an increase in people. And this has been cogently argued in the mid-2000s by the Greek scholar Alexander de Clunaris, who reframed this question for Big Plathers. And he argued that the 8th century increase in sites better reflected a change in settlement patterns and community structures particularly in response to mainland changes, rather than a dramatic population explosion. And so for instance, here in the proto-geometric period, we can see the scattering of identifiable sites here in red. And Gunaris argues quite convincingly that what we're seeing is a nucleated settlement pattern, with the proto-geometric population concentrated at fewer sites, rather than necessarily being a smaller population. And that the change that we're seeing in the geometric period is not this population boom, but rather a dispersed settlement pattern. So we're seeing lots of new sites, but initially with fewer people at less constant and less concentrated per populations. So the population is dispersing out throughout the landscape for some reason. And a population increase of some kind is likely, I'm not denying that, but there's more to the picture, and it was very likely less dramatic than literal takes on survey data might suggest. And particularly, we're seeing these new sites appear along coastlines, and this is actually a really critical factor. Something has changed in this period, and this is going to be the key to untangling what's going on, the details for which we still don't really understand. Okay, there's plenty of possible explanations. Um, there could be a demographic change, and several scholars actually argue that resource pressure poten potentially forced people to actually look for new resources and sites. We also might be seeing an escalation in sea traffic or changes in technology or at an organisational scale. So, for instance, are there more opportunities that now make the risk of living on the coastline worth it? Um, also, we could be seeing a change in safety. Was there less risk of raids? Or rather, did changing maritime or, military or maritime capacity or social structures make it easier for communities to defend themselves, given opportunistic piracy never really goes away in Greece? Or could we be seeing new um, a technological or social change in these, you know, rah, sorry, that meant that smaller communities were more resilient and able to thrive in these remote and exposed enclaves, or in politics that prompted subsets of communities to hive off on their own. For instance, we could be seeing new agricultural technologies and resource management techniques that opened up a whole range of previously liminal environments that could now be made productive particularly throughout the Arab islands. The whys remain debated, and the true explanation was likely multifaceted, which is why Zagora and Andros is such an important site, and I will geek out of it over it all the time. Founded in the early 9th, maybe even the late 10th century BC, what began as a small community rapidly boomed over a couple of generations, only for the inhabitants to then abandon this flourishing home around 700 BC, when we begin to see a renucleation of habitation on the island at Paleopolis to the north. And so Zagora offers a prime example for exploring these broader changes at the settlement and even the household level. Importantly, 
A century later, the abandoned settlement became a foci of cultic activity at the site, with an archaic temple built, including modifications to the site's entrance and fortifications. And so Zagreb's laid a footprint, while it's not necessarily zero, it's pretty light, and it offers us a rare opportunity to examine a settlement that's undisturbed by later full-time habitation, and particularly one that spans this period in question that we know so little about. Okay, so situated on this steep defensible promontory, the site demonstrates a close connection to both sea and the surrounding hinterland, which encompassed a mixed range of land suitable for diverse herding and cultural cultivation practices. And the question of herding is being examined by a recent uh, doctoral graduate, Dr. Rudy Alovich, who is looking at the animal bones through isotope analysis to study this question. But the original site location definitely aimed to capitalise on escalating maritime activity and trade passing by the southwest side of Andros. And Zagreb's harbours have several desirable features that would have appealed to early Iron Age seafarers. First, there's three of them, offering different options for shelter in different conditions depending on wind, currents, or your actual usage and need. Two, they all have freshwater outflow, outflows from springs higher up in the escarpment. And three, they each have a gentle beach without hitting rocks that's perfect for beaching early style vessels. But it actually has other advantages too. Number one being the imposing face that the promontory presents to the sea to passing traffic which is a deterrent against opportunistic raids. It's the first rule of self-defense. If you look like you're gonna put up a fight, people are less likely to pick on you and they'll go seek out other targets because effort. So Zagra's intimidating cliffs are a definite asset. But also, it's possible to bring small vessels right up to a series of flat ledges at the base of the site for ready offloading or loading as part of a small stop on a longer journey or to unload catches before breaching, uh, beaching your vessel for the day. And these are questions that a PhD candidate, Steve Vasilakis, is investigating. So in other words, Zagra had options in scope for a range of maritime interactions, context, or usage. And the site was likely well known for centuries by sailors as a safe harbour with freshwater resupply. And then by the mid-8th century, after all of this, the entire promontory had boomed. It was densely built up behind a fortification wall, and the structures excavated to date are primarily domestic, aside from the fortifications and a central cultic site, and this anomalous area that you have just heard Dr. Pascalas present on earlier. The regular layout is due to the nature of construction materials and methods rather than a singular urban plan. Specifically though, the site has been argued as evidence for the rise of civic institutions and urban planning, alongside coalescing ideas of gendered behavior and social interaction, as based on the regularity of buildings, differences in room sizes and in the configurational, spatial configuration, such as the change to multi-room dwellings, or the shift to them actually being wrapped around this central, unroofed space. Yet all too often the site plan is used to illustrate rather than interrogate preconceived ideas, many of which actually presume an inevitable trajectory of geometric society towards the polis and inevitable statehood. So it's undeniable that the geometric period was critical to the formation of later social values and material behaviours, yet viewing the geometric period simply as a precursor to classical Greece and not as a comprehensively developed society on its own, risks drawing false equivalences between earlier and later phenomena. Such has been the case with the houses at Zagora, which are frequently interpreted as the antecedent to the so-called classical courtyard house. The logic behind this interpretation is based on typological approaches to household space. Buildings are classed according to the room's shape, configuration and features, and certain types are argued as associated with particular values. We see this at Olynthos, which is a much later site, where commonly replicated features such as the central courtyard, restricted access from outside, multiple rooms, and a formalized ambron close to the street have been associated with household privacy and contextual gender separation. The argument is that if precursors to these features can be identified in earlier buildings like at Zagara, then a similar equation of burgeoning social values and codes of interaction can be inferred. This logic is a driving force behind discussion linking the appearance of the courtyard house, so-called at Zagara, to the politicization of the oikos and the rise of the polis. When considered at a superficial level, it's easy to see why the rectilinear form and multi-room houses of Zagora has been so enticing to these arguments. 
The morphology is very similar to early classical houses, such as here in Athens. Yet the problem with the type house method is that it is superficial, and it doesn't lay out understanding from the bottom up. How can we presume to judge the logic behind space if we don't consider the evidence for variability in behavioural practice and the concerns or factors that originally informed household decisions about how to build your space? So not only does the dynamism of household composition prohibit normative models, but the meaning and use of space is highly contextual and therefore mutable, depending on the time of day, season, occasion, the actors involved. And it's therefore inevitable that any normative or highly rationalised view of ancient houses will just lack explanatory force. As we'll see today by layering up our understanding of Zagra's domestic space, beginning with the overall site layout. For instance, it's easy to see here why so many respected scholars have seen Zagora as evidence for early orthogonal site planning. Particularly in terms of this long line of walling through here, uh, which has been argued as a key structuring element that was actually determined at the beginning of the site, and that it demarcated different zones of the settlement and the community. However, this is a schematic plan. It's meant to be an overview introduction to the site. It's the most commonly replicated image you'll see of Zagora. It's how most people think of it. Um, but the architect has actually simplified the design so that you get a sense of the overall picture and you can easily find where houses are. It lacks key details. So even when you actually query a more detailed image, and this is only just a little bit more detailed, such as this one here by the late Jim Coulton, which shows the wall lines and relationships, and I do just have to say that we remain indebted to Jim and his magnificent work reconstructing ancient buildings with respect to human lives. And I very much miss his gentle insights and generosity. His work is just phenomenal at the, um, at the site. But to get back to the point, you can see here that this wall was actually built in sections. It wasn't built all of a piece. And you can, the way that you actually get this common alignment is because they're building in this additive way. Each new building, you've got like an earlier building here, then you get this one tacks on and it's for it for whatever reason, whether it's just the ease and laziness so that you actually only have to build three walls to a house <laughs> or some sort of connection. They are adding on, taking their alignment from this one and the pattern goes as it slowly fills in and bumps up against similar expansive development from this hub of houses up here. <laughs> And one of the counters is that, well, that's the case, but surely there was still a plan laying down here. All these buildings are facing the same way. That suggests land allotments. However, there's, yes, there's definitely an idea of uh, property boundaries, and I'll come back to that later on. That's a thing, but whether that comes from a preconceived plan that's mediated by a central authority is a different question. Um, but importantly, as concerns the orientation, Zagora households wanted to have an either a southeast or a southwest orientation. So if you're building onto a house that's to your southwest, you can't stick your house facing that way. You're going to turn it to the southwest. And the next generations each have the same spatial limitations, and so the pattern continues. But Jim was also the first. Now, this, this is actually identifying relationships between walls, and it's how Jim sequenced the site's construction. But he was also the first to warn that relative chronologies for stone architectural relationships are really provisional because later renovations in stone architecture will completely overwrite those relationships. And so we really need to actually relate them to the excavator's stratigraphy, which once he'd done that, the architectural sequence changed completely. So for instance, here, H19, when he got together with Judy Birmingham and Dick Green, they actually were able to demonstrate that beneath this, early, this later building, there was an earlier version in the middle geometric. And so this building, when it was rebuilt later on, it took its alignment from this house because it's attached itself on here. And my PhD also revised the stratigraphy here for this building and suggested that this was actually an earlier house. And later on, when it was incorporated into it, the architecture was overwritten. So it's kind of problematic. But the more important point to take away is that the site plans, which are one of the main bases for academic interpretations, they're interpretations. They're each drawn for a different purpose with different conventions. And even the original state plans where you draw absolutely every stone, it's not just an objective thing because the drawer is always making an objective, I mean an interpretive judgment on what to actually include and how to delineate it. So do we actually need to kind of get more information about the people? And when it comes to Zagora, its habitation is often described as brief because it was only occupied for about 200 years. Yet, while it may seem obvious, shifting our chronological mindsets to think in terms of generations rather than arbitrary centuries or decades 
is a simple yet critical change to how we think about settlement sites. So Zamora, instead of just being 200 years, was occupied for several generations with the later inhabitants completely removed from the original founders. They had no living memory or direct personal relationships with those inhabitants. I mean, connections obviously existed, but they were intangible. We're talking about historical threads of identity, stories, customs, and tradition that were woven through with the physical landscape that successive generations inherited. And so by reconceptualizing the built environment of a community with respect to these processes and intergenerational dynamics, it's just a critical first step to starting to comprehend what's going on. And so when it comes to the early settlement, when you actually black out all the noise and look at what was there in the very beginning, you can see that we've got dispersed buildings all on a jumble of different alignments. And they're generally one and two roomed houses. And importantly, this meant that any messy, smelly, or activities that you required life that had to be carried up outside in full view of the community. We're talking about a very small village. It's a very small settlement community. By the next generation, you're starting to see a whole bunch of new rooms tacked onto those earlier halves. And so each new generation is adding on to the one before. And this pattern is suggestive of ambilocal residency patterns, which is a fancy way of saying that a new couple shows up and they're going to attach themselves to the parents' house of one of them. And so through this additive expansion, one of the key things when you're talking about an urban plan, more important than superficial things like alignment, it's all about layout and functionality and actually can you get from point A to point B in the settlement. And so at this point you're starting to see you've got freeform pathways people can you know, loosey-goosey roam about as well. But as you start to get all of the infill happening, these pathways start to become limited and get blocked off. And so by the time you're seeing multiple generations of this pattern start to proceed, you can see the infill has started to go through. You can see here that H19 has been realigned. And most important, when it comes to this event, it's actually taken a bite out of the earlier buildings that were on a slightly different alignment. You can just see its earlier wall through here. And an important point to bear in mind is that when you're building like this attached on to your neighbor, which may or may not be your dad or your brother or whatever, um, there's still someone that you've got to negotiate construction and renovation with. You've got to take down your roof to rebuild the walls. It's a whole mission. So you really want to make sure you've got good neighborly relations. Because also, most of these guys were building their own houses themselves. And so by the time you get to the final period, it gets really interesting uh, because space is limited, they're getting really creative, and you're starting to see some really interesting patterns starting to emerge as they sort of overcome these challenges um, as regards space. But interestingly here, they're also inheriting aging buildings from grandpa and great-grandpa that have got structural issues and cracks that need to be repaired. So what you're seeing is one of the earlier generations in that blue sort of phase, they like to build these ginormous ambitious houses, these one room buildings that are compensating for something. And their grandkids ended up with this house that was not holding up too well because the roof was just too heavy. So to resolve that, they started to subdivide these one room buildings, which creates these much smaller spaces and requires a new living space to be actually added on afterwards. And again, we've got no staple streets. You'll note that all of our pathways are gone. We actually haven't excavated any of the late geometric two pathways and access routes with the possible exception of what we did in 2019. So Jim was able to infer them from these rounded corners through here, that there's access ways along there, based on an analogy between current Cycladic towns where they've got rounded corners so donkeys and pack horses can get through. Um, but we actually don't know where they were. So were they trying to preserve it? Were they trying to actually juggle this? Was there a central authority behind all of this? Is this just a bunch of neighbors trying to kind of make it up and negotiate it as they go along? The truth is we don't know. And, but what we do start to see is the crystallization of property boundaries. But again, emphasizing that this has to be done through consensus and negotiation with your neighbor. And so one of the interesting examples, we've got a few of these, some are definitely not so positive. Um, but it's happening here in Area J. And this is one of the oldest um, areas that was actually developed on the site. We've got some very early buildings through here. Again, we don't understand their exact original version because it's been completely rewritten. But what we have been able to identify is that uh, this wall through here of J1, it actually was further up to the north um, originally. And so then you hit the next generation when these houses are all actually wanting to expand. But you hit a few interesting things. 
So whoever this guy is, he's built pretty much the last building in the, in the settlement that we've been able to date. It happens just before the site gets abandoned. But this guy's not giving any space away. This guy's got a big courtyard and they're not having any of it. So these two houses have worked together. They both needed to expand. And they've worked together so that this house, by adding on, bringing its wall in, adding on this new room, it's still expanded its original house footprint, but doing so in a way that lets their neighbour build new rooms and still preserve access to those deeper ones. So there's some really interesting dynamics when you start to think about people and behaviour. Whereas other rooms, coming back to this whole thing of finite space and challenges, um, we can start to see some other patterns start to happen with storage. So originally this building here was one of those giant rectangular ones that I mentioned, but it couldn't, didn't have the luxury of being able to subdivide. Because it seems like we haven't excavated out through here, but presumably there was just no more space left. So its solution to the structural integrity um, option was to remove the benches that were wrapped around like this guy here, taken them out completely, <coughs> created a square-shaped building, which is pretty much the limits that you can get for an open space without it falling down on top of you a couple of generations later. So we're still thinking about the future here. And they've gone and converted all of their storage into this compacted, tiered, multi-level storage thing. It's very space, space efficient. And you see these pop up all over the site as space becomes pressured. Um, we also still have in some of these older ones another interesting note on storage, uh, which these storage vessels, they're massive and they're kind of quasi-architectural, and several of them are clearly meant to be displayed, and they have myths and stories and allegories uh, depicted on it in relief. But we have two actually in situ, but what's important and funny about this is that neither of those pithoi fit out of the door. So their buildings have to be built or modified around them, and they were probably quite valuable, but the occupants couldn't take them when they left, so we got to find them in situ. But to come back to this whole thing with familial and neighbourly relationships, which change through time, as do household needs and capacity. And so successive generations thus are adapting their homes to meet current needs and dynamics, but within the framework of the built landscape that they inherited from earlier generations. And meanwhile, these intergenerational dynamics, family relations, human politics and emotion, nostalgia, conservatism, progressivism, whatever, as well as social bonds and connections and tensions, all of these inform decisions to alter and use space as well as how they get enacted. Yet few interpretations of these spatial changes, which are often discussed, they actually engage with um, such complexities and the social landscape and content. For instance, the change to multi-room dwellings at Zagaram has been argued as stemming from a desire for more functionally specific spaces, while the shift to a more internal emphasis with the creation of central unroofed yards is argued as, and you can see this change through here, is argued as evidence from, a, from um, the formalization of the oikos and a growing concern for household privacy and control over gendered interaction. Yet when considered in terms of movement and communication, the material evidence for the behaviour and the, the equivalence between the classical house and geometric houses just totally starts to unravel. So to actually look at this, I'm gonna walk you through syntax analysis, a form of access analysis. It's very simple. It's just a graphic rendition where you start from outside, you then knock in nodes for every convex space, which is just any space which you can see the whole interior of. So when you get like funny shaped rooms like this, that needs to actually get given its own separate node because you can't see around that corner. You then map out the number of stages it takes to get through into different parts of the room and possibly some of them would have communication circulation. Only one of our houses has that. Um, and you get this very simplified schematic graph that actually shows you how rooms were accessed and about patterns of communication. So this image is the same image we were looking at before, and it shows the earlier one roomed houses with their final late geometric equivalent after the modification. And when looking at the graphs showing the connections and sequence of access between rooms, it's easy to see why scholars have argued that the deeper, more subdivided arrangements were prompted by changing ideas regarding privacy and appropriate interaction between women and non-kin guests. Or as Ian Morris puts it, that the rear of the house was marked as female, secret, and internal. I am quoting here. Accessible only through male space. The later arrangements clearly had a greater scope for control over access and seclusion. But really, what are we actually seeing this whole thing about like penetration through male <coughs> space to access female space? When you actually factor in the built features, 
and actually consider about spatial properties such as the degree of natural light, which is essential for actual activities. Um, it becomes patently obvious that the deep spaces of feminine mystique that have been, people have made such a deal about are actually small, dark, and devoted entirely to storage. These are not private areas suited to activities like weaving, spinning, cooking, child rearing, general household management, economics, and production that women engaged in. And it's really difficult to imagine forcing your wife or daughter to hide away in there without strenuous objection. Most daily activities not involving storage would have been carried out in these other shallow spaces where the household's hearth is commonly located. And so when site plans are studied without context regarding installations of spatial properties that actually affect lived experience and the kinds of activities you can carry out here, such as light, shade, space, warmth, misreading the evidence is inevitable, especially if early Iron Age contexts are viewed through the lens of the classical courtyard house. And this versatility is also supported, I mean, sorry, the houses at Zagora generally focus on flexibility. You've got that living space and your outdoor space, and you kind of move your activities around as per needed. And this is a room that was excavated in 2014. And what you can actually see is what would have normally have been thought of as a storage bench because you've got these potting placements, but here we've actually got the bench top intact. And you can see a couple of things. One, you've got this work slab right next to it. And two, that pot emplacement is right up against the face of the other wall. So if you've got that vertical, vertical, um, vertical, vertical face of the wall there, your pot can't actually go out too far. So we're actually seeing these benches, we're not necessarily just about storage, even the benches are flexible themselves. And the pattern of wear in the floor surface through here actually indicates significant foot traffic from bench to half. And also, we actually found here this is the first one we found one, which is a schist line pot emplacement in the floor. So you can imagine that they've actually got like a water jar there right behind, and you've got all sorts of flexible pieces. Yet, despite their configurational time changes through time, flexibility and spatial use still pretty much remain integral through Zagro's houses. In fact, the appearance of the sheltered yards that have caused such a brouhaha about gender likely had a very pragmatic explanation. Zagora is windy. It is horrific, it's exposed when you're there in a northern wind, it is awful. So it's no wonder that the later generations, their parents have turned up and gone, yippee, we've got a new settlement, scattered those houses across there, and the winds, they experience the winds. You can't do anything outside when it's like that. We even had wheelbarrows being brought blown over. It was, it was horrific. <laughs> so wrapping your buildings as you do this additive expansion through generations, creating a sheltered space to work in makes total sense. And so if we actually take this further by mapping rooms in turn into their potential for natural light, it becomes clear that light was a significant factor in the structure, configuration, of use of space. And those central courtyards are, set, are critical to that. So a desire for sheltered but also well-lit workspaces drove the new, more enclosed designs. Central yards would have been key activity areas in and of themselves, while also enabling the provision of natural light to indoor spaces through open doorways or apertures. Regular patterns in room orientation have often also been cited as evidence for a cohesive urban plan. But as we've seen, those ev evident arguments really just don't hold up under scrutiny. And the excavators themselves had instead posited that the reason that the inhabitants preferred southern orientations was because of fierce northern winds, which does make sense. Yet, while mitigating adverse winds was surely a design element, particularly for the later generations who weren't better, um, comparing wind directions, which is here, against room orientations here, we immediately note that the winds still often come from the southeast and the southwest, which those of us that were digging in that part of the site can attest are just as fierce and awful to experience as the northern ones. So this is exactly where the majority of houses in Zagora face. So if it's not just about the wind, what else is it about? By mapping the movement of shadow in correlation to the trajectory of the sun at different times of the day or season, some particularly interesting patterns emerge. So these images overlay shadows in two hour increments from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can see here that in spring and autumn, spaces oriented, oriented to the southeast get really good light in the morning. Those oriented to the southwest get really good light in the afternoon. And in summer, that orientation is clearly designed to minimize penetration of the hot sun and its pattern holes across, across the site, which those of us here in Athens today would, would love to be able to have a shady apartment that doesn't get the sun beating in and heating it up all afternoon. 
And so back then they were designing their houses precisely for that. But also, it's winter that saw the most direct sunlight angles against exterior walls, which would have provided warmth soaking into the stone there and the potential for daylight to penetrate deeper into the house for longer, as you can see through here. By winter solstice, you should ideally be done with all your ploughing and planting. The sailing season is well and truly over, and now's the time for domestic industry and rest. In other words, this was likely the time when the house was at its fullest capacity throughout the day, and people are driving me nuts. As the patterning of domestic space with respect to daylight in the most extreme season, summer and winter, as we just saw, that really drives home the association between room orientation and sunlight. Houses were clearly designed to enhance the physical properties with seasonality and a broader natural setting in mind. And we shouldn't be surprised at this association. Not only is it prevalent in contemporary house design today, it's also emphasised by later authors, with both Xenophon and Aristotle underscoring the importance of light penetration in the winter, driving home again this importance of seasonality and in terms of actually thinking about domestic spatial use. Okay. And so this is an area J, which had previously been argued as one of the poor people's areas based solely upon the smaller room size. Uh, it actually would have been more de desirable in terms of living conditions due to the superior aspect of these rooms. And so the J18 house had, it was perfectly situated for all seasons, it was shady in summer, full sunlight in winter, but it had good light throughout the day. So you can see here on an autumn morning, you get good light straight into here, which is the half room in the main living space. You wake up with that light. As the day comes through, you've got mixed light throughout the house in those entranceways and a big lit up central area. In the afternoon, the light's shifting across, and this room has got really good light. While that half area that's in darkness now, but you can still use artificial light to illuminate it. Previous reconstructions of behaviour have tended to be atemporal, with a fixedness implicit in discussion of function, behaviour, or social meaning. Yet household space at Zagara seems to have developed around a need for flexibility, as we've said suggesting that functional use and the patterning of behaviour were highly fluid and contextual, subject to the particular demands of the occasion, time of day, or season. When it comes to artefact patterns at Zagara, the most striking pattern is the sheer number of complete artefacts that were abandoned in these houses. This example here from Area J is in the mid-range. Several rooms, just the rooms, not the whole house, had up to 30 to 50 mendable or complete objects, and there is no evidence for a cataclysmic prompting of the abandonment, so it's been a big mystery. When it comes to the assemblages themselves, the assemblages of each room at Zagra were highly variable, with no two rooms alike in terms of the shapes, counts, and functional ratios of artefacts found abandoned within. This is almost certainly affected by variable abandonment decisions, with households selecting different elements of similar late geometric equipment for removal or abandonment behind. So it's therefore difficult to discuss typical household and assemblages or equipment sets. Generally, the mixed distribution and assemblage patterns suggest that flexibility remained the norm for most of the spaces. Though artifact co-occurrence patterns can allude to functional associations. For instance, rope band pithoi regularly co-occur with cooking jugs, hydriae, pumice, or resource processing tools. And all of these artifacts seem to be the core equipment in these flexible multi-purpose houses those ones with hearths and that are associated with food preparation. And so room um, J15 though represents a striking exception to this last because it has all of the above with the exception of the resource processing equipment. It's the only one where you've actually got a house with resource equipment and that resource processing equipment like grinders and, and bread making and stuff like that, that's all not actually found in the main living space. Where it actually is, Instead, such equipment was concentrated in room J2 here, which is adjacent to the central courtyard, and it's a room which has got good afternoon light in particular, when J15 would have relied on most artificial light from the hearth. So we can't draw too literal uh, an association though between these fine spots. They do give us a bit of sense that there was a, an idea of time and place. But we have to bear in mind that a lot of these artifacts were portable, so you can only take, go so far in terms of reading spatial use and function for where an artifact is found, because people will generally stick the equipment out of the way and store it when they're not using it.
Okay, so coming back to actually explore some of the patterns that we've got in this house. J15 was clearly the main living room. Um, and it has a range of equipment, ranging from storage, you've got people, you can see here what I'm talking about in terms of equipment being stacked up all neatly and tidily when it's not in use. It's all kept around the edges of the room or up on the benches. Uh, you also had here this transport amp for art, which was actually quite most likely set into a recycled hydria neck, which has been flipped upside down and used as a stand. And you had a bunch of one-handled cups, which I'll come to in a second, as so well as a whole range of cooking equipment and other preparation equipment and also the ubiquitous spindle whorls. Now, to come back to these one-handled cups, the relief band people have got strong co-occurrence patterns with one-handled cups and shift Ds. So those are those big decorated um, pithoi. And both the distribution and co-occurrences of one-handled cups themselves suggest utilization as scoops in storage contexts in addition to their, compound, their consumption um, functions. So we've got flexibility in the use of objects themselves. We can actually see that here, the use where evident on these cups, um, where you can actually see that this cup has been scraping against the inside of the ceramic vessel as people have to actually get stuff out. Now, as regards spinning, this was common busy work for the multitasking woman in antiquity, as many hours of spinning were required to clothe and furnish a household, and also to actually equip sails for sailboats. But the task was not over, always overly demanding in terms of exertion or focus. Importantly, it was portable, and so it could be carried out wherever was desired according to considerations such as comfort, other activities engaged in concurrently, or whether people and tasks that needed supervision were located, whether they felt they were needed supervision or not. So I deliberately included this image of the Aya spinning, as any who have stayed in Greek communities or any real small village know just how iconic this image is of the older woman sitting in outdoor space, hands busy at some essential but time-consuming <coughs> task, while her eyes and minds clock everything. The key and I, Yaya, with her stockpile of gossip and CCTV-like knowledge of people's movements, remains an influential or indomitable force in small communities, since it is even meme-worthy still today. Optimal places for such work tend to be outdoors, shaded spaces with fresh breezes in summer or sun and warmth in winter. They therefore tend to be public or quasi-public, which of course provides an excellent opportunity to keep tabs on your neighbours or kids. And so in earlier phases, these observations were especially true, yet even as houses become more enclosed and sheltered from the winds, these dynamics were likely still at work especially as sound is just as key to community awareness and daily rhythms as light. But also, unlike later classical houses, the Zagra houses don't actually have much in terms of finite restricted access. Those courtyards are still fairly open and kind of liminal. But we also, in this house, and in several others on the site, have complete drinking assemblage, including a complete crater and likely also a wine amphora, which strikingly seems to have been selected for its matching aesthetics, as Dr. Pascalas has long noted. Now, these are more fragile vessels that are only used on specific occasions rather than repeatedly on a daily basis, and so their presence tucked away here on the bench um, supports the notion that this room attracted less intensive traffic compared to others, which is fuller analysis I don't have time to get into. Um, but they also might have been used in here. However, you can only say I had um, one of our colleagues, Yorgos from Batsi, I've got this fabulous photo I thought I'd included in here, but I clearly haven't, of him sitting cross-legged in the middle of that room. And he can only fit three Yorgos's in side to side. This is not a big space. So these craters were likely also brought out to outside. If you're going to have a wine party and a convivial party, you know, for whatever reason, you're not necessarily going to all squeeze in. It's very different to the classical context. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, the J18 house is not the only one to have craters and drinking assemblages in situ. In fact, whole craters, are present in more houses than not. Which brings us to the final question of Zagora's abandonment processes. First, let's consider this striking distribution patterns for craters, a vessel for mixing water and wine that was critical to convivial group drinking, literally central to the whole affair. Every fully excavated house that was not subjected to extensive plough damage had at least one crater. So area B and M, as you can see through here, they've only been partially exposed. The grey is all unexcavated. So you might come across people talking about these one-room houses. The truth is, we only dug one room. We don't know what else is there. And so far, all we can say is
is that we haven't found any craters in those single rooms. Whether they exist in any of the others, that's a mystery to be solved in the future. Um, but also, both the J7 house here and the H33 house here, which don't have craters, they were ploughed, their main living rooms were ploughed right down to, to floor, so they don't have much in general. So, in further excavation though, actually were to reveal that these patterns remain insane, what could we actually say? Are we seeing, as some scholars have argued, you know, poorer areas on the outskirts and more elite activities going on on the inside? Um, so we've seen that there's actually not really that much in terms of the main evidence that people cite for this is room size. We've seen that room size is subject to these generational changes, so not a strong argument. Um, but neither do actual artifact distribution patterns. So as you can see here, not only do areas J and B, the so-called poor people's um, houses, have some of the highest artifacts in general, they've also got the highest counts of non-local imported material, at least as we've been able to tell based on stylistic analysis. Digging a little deeper, it's clear that non-local wares and fabrics had a close correlation with function, particularly dominating serving and consumption related artifacts. Significantly, this category also represents the majority of equipment that was left behind in these houses. Food preparation and storage equipment is still there, and it still has fairly high counts, but it's got absolutely nothing on serving and consumption, particularly wine consumption. Um, nor on textile production, which is not loom weights, uh, it's primarily spindle wells. So where does this leave us with the craters? The distribution pattern is certainly striking, even allowing for uncertainty regarding outer areas of the site. As we've seen, there's little evidence for pronounced differentiation in terms of status or wealth across different parts of the site, or rather, that's not technically true. What we're actually lacking is that the means by which we seek evidence for such intangible phenomena, specifically room size, convivial activities, and important fine wear, that shows not obvious patterns. So either we're dealing with an egalitarian community, which, you know, yay, that could be a thing, or our methods for identifying elites in this period are totally ineffective as settlement sites. But the craters so far located do bear one thing in common. They're broadly scattered throughout the central part of the site, which happens to coalesce around the earlier cultic site, which is where they stuck the archaic temple. And so, a hundred years after full-time habitation ceased at Zagora, a community like the descendants felt the need to articulate and strengthen their ties to the site through cultic practice. And importantly, all of the houses were left in a very neat and tidy fashion. Hearts were often swept out and clear of debris, and equipment was left neatly stacked and ready for use, especially if you wanted to have a quick meal after getting in, say, late at night. And that's what you see here with this equipment left. You've got just enough cups to function as bowls for a meal. You've got enough equipment to make a meal left all right here next to the hearth. And so all of this evidence, uh, sorry, moreover, in their reassessment of the artifacts, my colleagues Paspalas and McLaughlin have been identifying a growing purpose of 7th century material in some of these rooms. So all of this evidence from the quantity of complete objects uh, the assemblage proportions and the functional characteristics, the tidy state of the houses, it raises questions as to what were the inhabitants thinking when they left. Was this equipment just discardable and of no value? Or did the inhabitants leave a select assemblage intentionally, one that would serve their basic needs should they return to site for short-term stays? And so this frequent presence of convivial equipment would kind of make sense if it was abandoned intentionally with a view to the inhabitants returning periodically to celebrate cultic festivals or potentially also harvest. And also looking again at J17's assemblage for this consistent aesthetic. The amphora in particular is slightly slumped and heavily worn and slightly misfired, all of it which gives it this kind of cute but sort of weary look. It's very battered and well loved. So while used domestic ceramics will of course be far more weathered and worn than we're used to, say, with funerary assemblages, it's hard not to wonder if the occupants were happy to leave this very well-loved set here in their old home, ready to serve again should they come and stay for a few days in the future. Craters and amphora in particular would have been cumbersome to love back and forth across the landscape. You can bring your own cup, but you're not gonna necessarily drag along your wine equipment. So it would make sense to leave this here. 
And also to this, this ratio of loom weights, uh, where we've got so little loom weights, looms were valuable, especially also well-balanced loom weight sets. So you're going to cut that off to your all-time home. But spinning, you're going to bring it with you because it's portable. It's perfect busy work to kind of do in those evenings when everyone's sitting around getting drunk and entertaining. Okay, so for the reasons, as I said, there may have been a harvest, resources established in the hinterland or to celebrate this annual festival. Uh, because also, Greeks don't give up good land. If you've inherited a, an orchard from your grandma or grandpa, you're going to travel away to harvest those olives, to harvest that fruit. If you have to go, like um, Yorgos, I mentioned at that scene, they travel off to Tinos while we were there, and they've all gone to harvest the olive things. They took the whole family for labor, they took a bunch of food and wine, and they had a big party to celebrate the shared labor. So it is a definite thing. So whether or not it's cultic or harvest or both, they could have been tied together, we don't know. Um, but it's important though is that it is a strong evidence for Zagora being abandoned but it wasn't completely relinquished. And so with all this in mind I want to challenge frequent characterization leveled at Zagora, that is that its abandonment was a tale of failure. So Whitley has actually argued that unstable sediment leadership led to the settlement falling apart and everyone's moved on. Others have uh, conceived of Zagora as a failed polis, basically a settlement that failed in this destiny to become a polis that everyone seems to presume was inevitable. Um, and so everyone is talking about this, but was it a failure? It wasn't abandoned because it was a failure. The steady growth of the settlement and its investment in domestic space up until its abandonment suggests a booming, successful town. Whatever the vision the original had inhabitants had, whatever gamble they took, it's Paid off. The forces behind Zagora's abandonment were likely many, complex, and interwoven. If the harvest, for instance, had originally been one of Zagora's assets, how much would changes in maritime traffic or the technology, especially deep and bottom vessels, have affected the decision to leave? After all, you can only actually entice people for so long. If you need a deeper harbour, you need a deeper harbour. And I suspect it's no coincidence that Paleopoly, where habitation ended up being centred on, on Andros, it's got this fortifiable deep harbour. So you can actually get a whole range of vessels, particularly lots of vessels. It's no longer just smaller vessels and smaller scale. So we don't know for sure that the inhabitants went to Paleopoly, but obviously there's timing factors here. Um, but importantly, the strength of the communal bonds forged at Zagora and centuries of investment in the site are attested in the abandoned assemblages that people didn't let go completely. Um, and also that they came back and built the temple, which suggests that the community did not easily relinquish their connection to the land, but it remained engaged with this locale. So even generations later, when immediate social memories of anybody actually living on the promontory, growing up on the promontory, this is all faded, but this connection remained pervasive. So by contextualizing Zagora and its houses, particularly in terms of lived experience, changing household needs, and intergenerational dynamics, we attain a sense of the community behind the material and perhaps the people that shape the geometric settlement through centuries of daily choices. Thank you. I'd like to call on Australia's ambassador to Greece, Mr. Spiel, um, to give a few words of thanks. Thank you. through the loss of the last two years of, of not having such wonderful reports and wonderful speeches. I should say, so dear Dr. Pascalas, Dr. Mann, and uh, Professor Gabito, who's no doubt with us today, um, watching us and, uh, and, and admiring um, how his uh, legacy is being taken forward. Um, it's a great honour, actually, to be here and to be able to um, say a few words. I'm conscious that I'm the public servant in the house and I'm the one standing before the function. So I'll be very, very short. 
Um, but I did want to say I'm very honoured to be here, and I'm very honoured to be here for a number of reasons, not just as Australia's ambassador, but um, because some of you know, certainly um, Lucy knows from the embassy, and uh, and uh, Lipa knows from uh, when we were in Kitha recently that, of course, diplomacy is Plan B. Archaeology was going to be Plan A. Um, but having actually just witnessed uh, these two presentations, I think I'm probably best staying where I am and leaving this to the experts. Um, I have to say a, a, a very warm congratulations for the work um, that the AAIA does, um, the linkages that it makes, the education that it provides, um, and the journeys that it takes us on. Um, the ability to be able to really delve into um, our own humanity, um, whether it's today's or um, from 900 uh, BC. I'm actually renovating a house here in Greece. Um, I was taking notes, you might have seen. Um, the multifunctionality is really, really useful, I think. Um, the capacity to avoid the word yes in the cyclades as well as the south southeast winds, I think is is universal. Um, I found um, that uh, the capacity to even vicariously for us who aren't archaeologists go on these journeys uh, is exceptional. Leader um, took me on a journey of uh, of Paleopora at Kithira, um, which is a magnificent site. Um, and all of a sudden, all of these urges to understand who these people were, to try and reconstruct the story, to come up with theory, I think is as human uh, and as ancient as time itself. And I'm really, really grateful for um, being able to go uh, on that journey. What I wanted to basically say is that um, I'm very, very grateful to the AAIA and to the friends of the AAIA for the sort of insights that we get into our humanity and with such deep respect, not jumping to any conclusions. You saw the, the great care with which um, our previous two speakers were analysing what may have happened without drawing those conclusions and forcing an issue, but really taking the care slowly to understand how humans lived and what that means um, for our shared humanity. Um, two things I'll leave you with as a lay person. Um, I am particularly grateful for the conclusion that there was a wine a crater in every single house potentially. <laughs> I thought that was really human um, and, uh, and something that hasn't necessarily changed all that much. Um, and it's something that really draws you into these houses and from that hearth that we talk about where people may have sat and drank and shared or if there were more of them outdoors as you said um, to be able to from that epicenter reconstruct a little bit more about about their life and the second thing being a Greek Australian what I was really taken with which was I thought fascinating um, was the idea of why um, this settlement um, was abandoned and how it wasn't fully abandoned and how leaving doesn't mean abandonment. In fact, leaving can mean investing the space several generations later with great meaning. And as a Greek Australian who, as I said, is now renovating my village house, this return, not for cult purposes, but as a pilgrimage is something that is very, very deep. Um, is universal and is very current, even though the thing that we were talking about was from 900 um, BC. So thank you very, very much. Congratulations on, um, uh, on rejoining the effort after two years of hiatus. Um, congratulations to the friends of the AAIA for being able to keep the fires burning during COVID. Um, and no doubt, given what we've heard, there'll be many, many wonderful discoveries to share that we'll all celebrate in the future. Thank you.
And now um, you're all most warmly invited to the reception, which will take place at the Swedish Institute, which is two and a half blocks away or so. Um, I'm sure the way will be led by those who know the way. And um, uh, those who don't know where the Swedish Institute is, please just follow and you'll find it uh, shortly enough. Thank you very much for your attendance.